going to go ahead and get started. We've got four great talks. I don't want to have anybody run out of time, so we're going to start on time if we can. My name is John Gray. I have Michelle Kalos with me, and we're both happy to host uh, our, our symposium today on, on new directions in clinical trials for musculoskeletal disorders. And I'm going to go ahead and get right started on it. Uh, again, uh, the society has relaxed its photography policy, but please be respectful to the presenters and uh, remember that what they are presenting is, is their property and if you would like to uh, take photos and reproduce it, you'll need to talk to the presenter and get permission, please. Uh, also silence your cell phones and please be courteous. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and start off and introduce our first speaker, uh, April Pyle who is going to be talking about CRISPR-Cas9 deletion strategy that targets the majority of DMD patients in human iPSC-derived muscle cells. Sorry, the, the, uh, for the people in the back, we don't have a mouse to use as a pointer, and so we're going to have to only point to the laser with the laser pointer on the front screen. So you'll either have to see this screen or not be able to see where the speakers are pointing. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to present our work. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you about ongoing work that we've been doing in the lab. Um, so my lab focuses on human pluripotent stem cells. Um, and these cells have remarkable ability to generate um, all cell types in the body. At UCLA, we have a center for Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, where we have access to um, patients um, with DMD, which is a disease that we study. Um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is uh, due to mutations um, in the largest gene in the genome. Um, and it's a devastating muscle disease, affects about 1 in 3,500 boys, um, and there is no cure. So what we've been doing is developing disease models in a dish um, for DMD. Um, we've been able to obtain uh, fibroblasts from patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, we've been obtaining patients um, that have mutations within a hot spot region, which I'll come back to. Um, and then we've been able to, uh, using nominacra factors, uh, direct reprogramming of these cells uh, to iPSCs. And then we've been thinking about uh, developing uh, CRISPR correction strategies as well as uh, directing them to differentiate into uh, skeletal muscle progenitors. So um, as you all may or may not be aware, um, dystrophin is a major structural protein um, in muscle. It has a key role in stabilizing the muscle cell membrane. It interfaces with the actin cytoskeleton um, and also um, sort of complexes and stabilizes the dystrophin glycoprotein complex um, at the muscle cell membrane and interfaces here at the F extracellular matrix. And so without dystrophin, so usually there's an out-of-frame mutation, no dystrophin protein is produced. This leads to uh, muscle instability and loss of the dystrophin glycoprotein complex. Um, there's an allelic disease um, of patients uh, called Becker muscular dystrophy, which is due to in-frame um, deletions. And this uh, Becker protein actually is a um, functional protein, albeit truncated, but uh, can serve as a stabilizing factor in the membrane um, to stabilize the DGC and interface with the active side and skeleton. So you can see here cross sections of uh, patient muscle sections. Um, this is uh, wild type, this is um, DMD with no dystrophin, and this is Becker. So you can see that you're able to restore um, dystrophin. Uh, in these um, muscle uh, sections, in these Beckers. So there's a large uh, push to really think about therapeutic strategies to restore the reading frame um, from a DMD into a um, Becker-like phenotype. And so this was our approach to think about generating a Becker-like uh, protein from a DMD uh, protein. And so to do this, this was a collaboration um, with Melissa Spencer, we have a shared graduate student, Courtney Young, who worked on this project. And we wanted to develop CRISPR-Cas9-based targeting strategies um, for this approach. And so to do this, uh, Courtney developed guide RNAs within the introns spanning in between 44 to 55 here, as well over here, between this hotspot region. So remember I told you there's a hotspot of mutations um, for patients that have Duchenne. Um, this is within exons 45 to 55. Um, and this is actually 
um, you know, a region that if Target could treat um, more than uh, half of patients with Duchenne. And so this is another reason why we wanted to think about this strategy. So we developed um, IPSC lines uh, from different patients. You can see we have patients here, one, two, zero, three, six, and eight, that have different mutations that require removal. If you want to re regenerate, sort of remove this entire region, um, you can remove uh, either five, nine, or 12 exons up to 725 KB in this platform. And so this would then remove this entire hotspot region and generate a reframe dystrophin moving 45 back in frame with 55. Um, or 56. And so another reason that we wanted to do this is also the protein um, by deletion of this um, is uh, likely more functional. Um, and so this is another um, ongoing strategy um, to think about targeting this entire hotspot region. And so um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because this work is published, so you can read this. But essentially, across all of these lines, we were able to generate in-frame um, deleted IPSC lines. Um, because these are pluripotent stem cell lines, they can differentiate into the affected cell types, um, in this case, skeletal um, and cardiac muscle cells. And so you can see here that we were able to um, get dystrophin uh, re uh, produced here in cardiomyocytes as well as skeletal muscle. And then shown here by Western blot, we were able to restore dystrophin um, in this model. And so in terms of function, um, we are still uh, closely looking at function of the dystrophin produced in this platform. Um, Courtney developed sort of a hypoosmolarity stress test, essentially where we're able to um, evaluate the creatine kinase release, um, which is a measure of leakiness in this uh, muscle membrane. And um, here is shown in cardiomyocytes looking at CK release. When we have an out of frame, um, we have extensive release. When we have the reframed line where we've removed the hotspot region, 45 to 55, we've reduced um, this release in this um, assay. And then um, in engraftments, which are, I'll tell you more about, um, we were able to also show um, dystrophin as well as um, expression of the DGC um, in these um, uh, in these experiments. So the question really is, how do we think about translating this um, platform from here in vivo? And so um, we're really, um, with Melissa Spencer, embarking on two avenues, um, trying to develop uh, direct delivery components. We are really interested in thinking about non-viral approaches. Um, and I'll show you some initial studies um, on this work. And um, I'm also very interested in trying to think about how to um, utilize uh, skeletal muscle stem cells derived from human pluripotent stem cells um, as an alternative uh, delivery strategy for this platform. So one of the things that really is lacking in the field is uh, humanized models to really test some of these um, ongoing strategies. And so Courtney um, also developed a novel humanized mouse model um, for testing CRISPR therapeutics in this platform. Um, so here she took an existing um, a human DMD mouse, so this one has a, um, uh, a, um, a, by Anamika and colleagues that were developed, and essentially what we did was we um, mutated the, the human um, gene. We, here we actually, in this case, removed um, 45, so we have an out-of-frame human um, DMD, and then we crossed these mice to the MDX mice um, so that they would uh, have a dystrophic phenotype. Um, MDX or MDXD2. And so we have this mouse that we're calling human DMD del 45 MDX. Um, and this is also published. You can read more about this mouse model. Um, but essentially, this mouse model, um, as you can see, uh, this is wild types. You can see human dystrophin in our um, human del 45 MDX mice. You can see that they lack dystrophin um, as well as have dystrophic um, pathology. So um, we think this is actually a nice model to start to evaluate some of these um, ongoing CRISPR therapeutic strategies. Um, here, um, we were wanting sort of a, um, an approach to think about uh, likely a positive control for some of the non-viral experiments we're doing. Um, so we uh, collaborated with Jeff Chamberlain. Jeff nicely um, developed a A6 for us for this platform. We're using um, two different, um, here are the CK8, as well as the guide RNAs inserted, um, as well as with the control DSRED to be able to monitor um, delivery in this uh, platform. Um, and so what we've seen is actually we can get pretty nice restoration um, of um, dystrophin using AV, about uh, 35%. 
Um, and so this is compared to control um, where we have none. And so this is a really nice um, approach to think about um, AV-mediated um, restoration of dystrophin um, in this model. And Courtney actually has a poster on this today if you want to learn more about um, this strategy. But one of the things that we're concerned about um, with AAV, essentially, as you probably all are aware, is that there's a small loading capacity and uh, may not officially target satellite cells, although there's some exciting work here, I think, at the meeting that um, is going to help us in this arena. Um, so I think that we need to think about targeting the stem cell. This is a critical issue. Um, there may be um, an immune response that may prevent readministration. Um, and we don't know yet, CRISPR in this context may likely be inefficient if Cas9 is sticking around. This is also um, a concern. Um, and so there may be an enhanced immune response, something that we need to think about. And then the question of how long is this going to last um, is still, I think, an ongoing question in the field. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about is nanoparticle based deliveries. Um, this is really um, ongoing work that is a collaboration. Um, by Melissa, my lab, and Juan Ming's lab. And so Juan Ming is our um, resident nano expert, and, and we've been trying to develop different nanoparticle-based strategies um, to think about delivering CRISPR um, in skeletal muscle. And so this is ongoing, but essentially we are utilizing, um, comparing different type of nanoparticles. This one shown here um, is um, something that we've been looking at, nanoparticle trafficking. Um, and we've been developing polymer-based nanoparticles, um, essentially that self-assemble um, with cargo and then deliver these inside um, skeletal muscle. And here we've just delivered a control um, GFP reporter um, in primary murine muscle cells. You can see that we're getting um, GFP expressed in these cells. Also, we're now testing the CRISPR exon 45 to 55 deletion strategy, um, and we're getting a uh, nice um, in-frame deletion using this platform. So in vitro, it seems to be um, we're making some headway. Um, in vivo, it's a little more challenging, and this uh, work is really ongoing to try and compare the efficiencies of this. Um, and Michael Amame had a poster on this, so hopefully you had a chance to stop by uh, and talk to him about this strategy. So this work is really ongoing, and um, what I'm trying to really think about um, as well, as I said, are the sort of uh, uh, directions of thinking about the stem cell. Um, because what you may or may not know is that there is a beautiful muscle stem cell that is the critical regulator of um, muscle function regeneration. After injury, the cell gets activated. Um, the cell is you know, beautifully positioned um, here on the outside um, of the myofiber in between the sarcolemma and the basal lamina. And upon injury, this cell gets activated um, to divide, proliferate, and generate new myofibers. And there is discussion in the field whether or not there are disturbances um, in this model in DMD. Uh, Rudnicki and others uh, have shown that DMD uh, is expressed in the satellite cell, act as, acts as a polarity protein. Um, and regulates the balance of symmetric versus asymmetric division. And if so, then this could um, you know, really cause the stem cell to have aberrant division behavior uh, compared to wild type. And so really there's ongoing studies in the mouse model, in particular looking at um, how the stem cell behaves in dystrophic mice. And really the role of the human uh, satellite cell is less clear. And so we've been trying to develop a model to really generate a satellite-like cell um, to study this um, in the context of DMD, as well as potentially look at engraftment and or functional potential of cells derived from pluripotent stem cells, especially with or without CRISPR correction. And so what we've been doing, um, this work is um, um, really recent work where we've been trying to understand what type of cell we're making from human pluripotent stem cells. And we've done this by trying to understand what types of cells we make compared to the gold standard human, um, fetal, as well as adult. And what you can see here, we're looking at uh, satellite cells obtained from adult. These cells nicely um, fuse, uh, very, make very uh, large multinucleated myotubes. And if you compare this to um, fetal across development, you can see that when we make uh, you know, muscle from human pluripotent stem cells across either method here, this is a Shell or um, Shelton, and we've done this across she and other published protocols, that they do make 
you know, pretty nice muscle in a dish. They express myosin heavy chain. Um, you can get PAC7 positive cells, MyoD. Um, but these seem to be more embryonic or fetal-like um, that were generating not equivalent um, to the adult. And if you look at their fusion ability, which is a nice readout for function, uh, these cells have the ability to fuse very nicely in adult, but pluripotent stem cell derives are not very efficient. So to really rigorously test function of cells that we make from pluripotent stem cells, we've been um, looking at engraftment assays in MDX, so we crossed MDX, which is the, again, the mouse model for DMD to NSG mice. Uh, we induce cardiotoxin, then we engraft our cells, and then we look 30 days later. Um, when we do this, what we can see is that pluripotent stem cell-derived cells, um, uh, after these directed differentiation strategies, showing here is dystrophin in green, don't really engraft that well. If you take fetal cells, actually, these cells nicely engraft. You can see robust restoration of dystrophin. Um, in this mouse model. And so what this told us, and if you culture these, you sort of lose this potential. And so what this told us was that, um, you know, we have a very inefficient um, population of cells that can engraft uh, from pluripotent stem cells. If you have a gold standard fetal, these, uh, you know, can give you up to 125 to 150 um, restored fibers uh, per um, you know, region, and so for cross-section. And so this is something that, you know, was really uh, bothering us, so we wanted to think, well, is there any population in there that potentially we could pull out that would improve the engraftment of these cells? Um, and so to do this, we use the kind of the gold standard marker in the field for um, human and, um, in, and across um, many platforms. And NCAM essentially was one that, you know, a lot of people use, so we started there. And when we enriched for NCAM and we also depleted for uh, other neural uh, cells and culture, that we saw that these cells actually did have increased ability to fuse in vitro, so we could get an increased fusion index with our NCAM enriched cells. Um, but when we tried to engraft these in MDX NSG mice, there was very inefficient um, engraftment as shown here. So only a few fibers, very similar to um, cells that, uh, that have been uh, passaged. So very inefficient engraftment with NCAM enrichment. So then we looked for additional markers. Um, so we actually teamed up with some of our collaborators at USC who were doing a whole musculoskeletal RNA sequencing profile. And we looked at the muscle uh, profile in this, and we actually found um, uh, other receptors that we wanted to evaluate, really, especially we honed in on some new ones that we weren't really expecting to find. And um, here we looked at these in terms of ability to enrich for a more myogenic cell from a pluripotent stem cell. And when we did this, we found that these two markers, ERBB3 and NGFR, really helped to enrich our um, myogenic cells. And you can see here that this increased the fusion index um, of our human pluripotent stem cell-derived myogenic cells. And so these really seem to be helping us enrich for um, pluripotent stem cell-derived cells um, that can fuse in culture. So what are these markers? Um, well, these studies are ongoing to try and define what these markers are enriching. But when we look at facts analysis, we can see that there's a couple populations in the directed differentiation cultures. And depending on the protocol that you use, you may have more or less of these fractions. Um, and so one of the things that we noted, we sort of pulled out individual fractions of single positive, um, high, and intermediate populations. And we noticed that the ERBB3 NGFR double positive cells actually seem to enrich for um, PAC7 as well as MIF5 expressing cells. Um, and then these cells actually fuse better um, in culture. There is myogenic activity in the other populations, um, and so we're trying to understand currently what the differences are um, in these populations in terms of myogenicity. But what I really like about this enrichment strategy is that this seems to work across all lines, and this is really exciting for us because here we're looking at um, the wild type as well as the dystrophin as well as the CRISPR corrected lines. And you can see they were able to enrich for myogenic cells um, across all of these strategies, uh, all of these lines. And so this is exciting because now you can really start to think about functional assays um, for the muscle in the context of dystrophic as well as CRISPR corrected um, lines. And so we further then wanted to look at um, the um, you know, how are these muscles, again, compared to adult? So the factors are enriching uh, for uh, still, a, we think, a fetal-like cell um, in culture. And so they're still not equivalent to the gold standard adult. 
um, cells that are fusing in cultures. But we noticed that there were a differential expression of TGF-beta members. Um, and this is also something that's known um, in the field, that TGF-beta is regulation of uh, muscle cell fusion. And so what we did was we tried to add um, a TGF-beta inhibitor um, in this culture system. And when we did that, we found that these cells actually fused even better, and we got even greater um, myotubes in culture. And not only that, we were able to increase expression um, uh, here shown here by Western blot of adult um, mice and heavy chain markers. And so this really is helping to give us a more mature muscle um, in a dish. You can see here with TGF-beta inhibition that we have much more aligned and defined um, and um, more mature myofibers in a dish. And so with this, we wanted to then look, going back to our in vivo question, you know, how do these stem cells behave in an engraftment model, um, especially with CRISPR correction? Um, we put these cells in, again, the um, directed differentiation strategies. Uh, we can expand these for seven days. Um, we do cardiotoxin. We added then the TGF-beta inhibitor in the uh, context of the first few days of engraftment. Um, and we can see that this actually helps us to get more engraftable cells. Um, shown here is the ERBB3 cells, but the double positive cells also engraft um, pretty well, maybe even a little better than the single positive cells. Um, and so we're able to get nice um, engraftment in this system. And this is now equivalent to our gold standard, if you will, of the fetal um, wild type cells in culture. And so this now is kind of uh, leading us in the direction of trying to understand, OK, now we have an engraftable model, um, but what types of cells really are the most regenerative um, in the system? Do we have a stem cell in the system? Um, what are the differences in the progenitors that we're making compared to the adult stem cell? Um, and so what we're doing now is we're doing a large um, a drop seek, uh, single cell sequence analysis of the different populations of cells across development to try and understand um, how do we transition these cells to the most regenerative cell because our long-term goal would be able to develop, um, you know, strategies to get more muscle stem cells and grafting and particularly cells that have the ability to repopulate after continuous injury, um, which still really hasn't been shown in the field. And so we're trying to understand, um, you know, better about which of these cells in both human development as well as pluripotent stem cell derived cells can do this. And of course, we're continuing with Melissa to think about alternative strategies to really think about the stem cell targeting um, approaches to um, think about direct delivery um, in this context and this work is, is ongoing. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank the team. And so this is uh, Melissa Spencer, as well as Juan Ming. Juan's been doing all the nanoparticles. Um, and the people that really did this work, uh, Courtney, who is a really a fabulous uh, recent uh, PhD. Um, and she, did all, she developed all the CRISPR platform, as well as um, you know, the ongoing work with AV and nano. Courtney's thinking about uh, Michael Amame has also now joined the team, and he's doing um, AV um, and nano as well. And Michael Hicks is really uh, leading the engraftment studies and others in the lab are doing a lot of the characterization of the different uh, progenitors. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you, that was very interesting. Um, in terms of engraftment, in the studies that you showed, mm -hmm. were you doing intramuscular injection? Yes, and we did yeah. direct injection into the TA. So we yeah. did cardiotoxin, and then we put a direct injection of the cells, and then we waited 30 days, and then we suction and stain. Yeah. Okay, so do you, are you thinking about other ways that you might deliver in a more comprehensive way? Into more muscles? like systemically? Yeah. Yeah, we are. So we've been also doing, um, uh, nanoparticle mediated strategies to try and uh, get stem cells uh, to more regions. And so in hmm. concert, we've been also doing that strategy. It's really uh, new work, so it's ongoing. We haven't really uh, seen that great of efficiency, so we're still, we're still optimizing that. Okay. Hi, April. Yeah. Beautiful talk. Thank um, you. I was wondering, in the transplant studies where you um, gave the recipients the TGF inhibitor, yeah. Do you know what target cell that inhibitor is acting on in that, in that study? Yes, that is a great question. Um, we don't know. In fact, so we're doing those experiments right now. We're trying to understand really 
with and without the TGF beta inhibition, what is happening, and we're actually pulling out uh, cells after the engraftment and trying to, it's really hard, trying to do single cell analysis of the different populations and looking, you know, in that context what it's doing. We don't know. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, that's also something I was curious about yeah. just to follow up on that. So, so that was, again, the NSG crossed model? Yes, yes. So you have no T cells? That's right. And, and so... Yeah. Mm, we were stuck with that model, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. TGF-beta could have such a significant effect yeah, in so the context of almost no immune system. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and so, I mean, there are studies that TGF-beta, at least, is uh, regulating MyoD and so, so sequestering it. So if you inhibit that, then it mm. allows the cells to fuse. So molecularly, we think maybe that's happening, but in vivo, we, we don't know, so we need to look at that. It's a great question. Interesting. We have time for another question. Anyone? Any more? Okay. Thank you, April. Thank you very much.